Before we get into our Tyler Hamilton uh, interview, which we'll play right off the back of this, here is just a, a snippet to remind you of what life was like way back in 2003 before it emerged that uh, Tyler Hamilton was on his own crazy, screwed up doping program. He's part of Operation Puerto and Fuentes and that uh, type of doping. Um, anyway, look, we can get into all that in a couple of minutes' time rather than me uh, presupposing any more details on it. But here you go. Here first is a report that Hamilton worked with back in 2003 before it emerged that he was doping. He was stronger than ever, more confident than ever. But Tyler Hamilton's hopes of winning the Tour de France He's back. And there's been a mass pile up there. I think it was Tyler. came crashing down on the Tour's very first stage. One or two riders there seriously injured. Worked so hard to get to that point. To have it all come crashing down on stage number one, and it was just like a nightmare. Hamilton fractured his collarbone in two places. The thought of him getting back on that bike to finish the most grueling race on earth was doubtful, if not laughable. But look at Tyler Hamilton. But there he was, the very next day, pedaling away. Hamilton putting in a big ride for home. The crash produced a clean break of the collarbone. If he could withstand the excruciating pain, he could finish the tour. Pressure, look at that smile. It goes Hamilton forward. didn't just finish. He won a stage. He claps. He believes in himself. He is the day's winner. He pedaled down the Champs-Élysées in fourth place overall. Not by ignoring the pain, but by embracing it. I know that I can push my body through a lot of pain. You know, that helps, that helps me, and I also, uh, it could be discouraging for my competition. Hamilton will lead a new team this year, Team Fonac, a team built specifically so Tyler can win the tour. But standing in his way is a very good friend, a former teammate, the five-time champion of the Tour de France. Oh, Hamilton gone. has gone this time. He's attacking Lance Armstrong. It I'm has going to win the race, then I have to, <laughs> you have to beat Lance Armstrong, which is a tough task, and nobody's been able to do it. In my eyes, he's a, he's a hero. He's, a, he's one of the biggest sports heroes in the, in the world. But that doesn't mean I don't want to beat him. And so the race starts here, in the hills overlooking Boulder where Tyler Hamilton thinks about winning the Tour with every breath he takes. I have to think like I can win. I have to train like I can win. All right, a cycling special for you this morning. We've got Tyler Hamilton with us. Tyler, how the hell are you? I'm doing well. Welcome to Ireland. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's great to be here. People might have seen a, a blur of uh, a, a super fast cyclist along the west coast over the last couple of days. You've been incognito checking out our roads. I was checking out your roads. I don't think it was a blur, though. <laughs> yeah, I ride pretty slow these days. Um, but yeah, I, was, I uh, flew in last week, took the train over to Galway, and found this route called the, what, the uh, Wild... Atlantic, Atlantic Way, way yeah. yeah, and it was awesome. I rode up up to the north and just uh, man fell in love with this place. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Uh, people were super friendly. Roads were spectacular. Any cycling yeah, fans? I, I want to come back. Did you get recognized by the cycling fans, or was it? I was pretty low key. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I don't know. I kind of looked like a, a Joey, so to speak. Out there. <laughs> I was on a rental bike and um, kind of an upright sort of. Yeah hybrid type bike right and uh yeah i just went from hotel to hotel i even had my camping gear so i camped out one night very nice yeah and the weather was okay it played ball yeah the night i camped out it rained sideways <laughs> but it was um but it was a lot of fun it was well, a good experience yeah that i definitely a... want to come back and maybe someday do the whole thing yeah yeah no i mean get a group of people to do it and raise some money for a good cause yeah well uh, we would definitely be happy to help out with that uh, the wild atlantic way people would be guys only, ride? only too delighted to a little bit yeah, uh, no, we do. You don't have to do the whole thing. We'll do little sections. You can yeah. come in for sections. Well, we could actually practice in advance so that we're actually capable of doing the whole right. thing. So I'll coach you. Yeah, well, that sounds great. Okay. That's Paniagua, you, though. Yeah, Paniagua, totally. Uh, that's what you do these days, right? You you kind of teach people to. Uh, yeah, cycle. I coach people. Yeah. yeah, I do a couple of different things, but that's one of the things I do. The other thing I think that you do is you tell people your story and you tell people your truth. Yeah. Which I guess at some point gets a bit easier and easier and easier. Yeah. Or is it always difficult to revisit? Um, it's always a little bit difficult, but it has gotten a little bit easier. I would say the you know the beginning, the beginning was really tough. It was really tough, um, 
And it, I mean, every time I do it, yeah, it brings me back into the moment for sure. You feel the emotions, and you know, it was, it was a dark part of my life for sure. Yeah, because yeah. even at the best of times, it was pretty dark. There's two sides to that, right? There's the yeah. the bit where you ultimately have the truth slowly come out and, and kind of it it. It's, it feels to me it's a bit like peeling an onion that there's layers and layers and layers and that at various stages you kind of feel like you've made a breakthrough and then you realize oh, I've got a little bit more that I need to sure, people. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, I'm clear now. It's like, yeah. oh, just that yeah. those, those last few people that I haven't told exactly yeah. everything to. Yeah. Um, but then there's also that, that thing that you've talked about even at your best moments. Like, there's this emptiness. Yeah. Because you yeah. don't fully believe in yourself. Yeah, standing on the podium in the Olympic Games. On the top step of the podium. Gold medal. Didn't feel like it should have, you know. That's wrong, you know. But you should never feel that way. Well, I, I certainly did. How did it feel? How would you? Yeah, a little bit it? empty. You know, obviously, you know, it's still exciting. But like, you know, I dreamed my whole life of winning a gold medal uh, in any sport. Really, I, I remember watching the Olympic Games in 1980. They were in Lake Placid, in the Winter Olympics, and I remember watching the U.S. team win the win the hockey finals. And then uh, I remember Eric Hyden winning the five gold medals in speed skating and. I was like, that's what I want to do, you know? Because you were a skier a first. Medal. Yeah, I was a ski racer, downhill ski racer. Yeah. Yep. And then, yeah, you know, fast forward, whatever, 20 years, and there, 25 years, and there I am in Athens. And yeah, it didn't, didn't feel anything like it should have, for sure. The level of excitement that you felt, obviously, because, you know, you're talking about um, phone calls are coming in, the, the talk shows want you, people are paying you money just to kind of stand in their yeah. corporate area, and you're like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll take the checks and I'll rub shoulders with yeah. them. How long does that kind of mask the fact that there's something inside where you're going, do 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 something's yeah. wrong here? But, you know, you just keep going. We just, you know, life was so 100 miles an hour at that time. You just kept, you know, kept those feelings would pop up. I called them, you know, they'd pop up sometimes in the middle of the night. So I'd be looking at the ceiling, you know, between 2 and 3 in the morning. I called them committee meetings, you know. And you think about it, but then you just bury those feelings and, you know, keep nose to the grindstone, keep going, keep going. But eventually, yeah, eventually, yeah, eventually I had to deal with it all. You know, I had to deal with the truth, I had to deal with, you know, what it did to me personally, like on the inside, and yeah, it was hard. I went through you know, kind of a dark period for a while. Yeah. yeah. After the truth came out? Uh, yeah, well, before, there, certainly for, for a while, you know, I got caught, and I lied about it for a long time. I thought I was doing it for the right reasons, you know, for myself, for my teammates, for the whole Peloton, the whole secret, you know, keeping that secret going. Keep, you know, it was the code of the Amerta. Yeah. Code of silence. So I was prepared to go to the grave with my secrets. You know, I didn't want to be the guy telling the truth. And, you know, I took a, a grand jury subpoena to, you know, get, I basically backed up and backed up and back, backed up. And I was either jump off the, the cliff or tell the truth. But you say jump off the cliff, and it's not, it's not, a, it's not a turn of phrase for you because you had. Oh you, yeah, you suffered from depression yeah, throughout your life. Yeah, yeah, and I, I had suicidal thoughts. I was because I was, you know, I was a mess inside, trying just trying to bury the truth. And then the, you know, getting subpoenaed and having to tell the truth in front of the grand jury was the best thing that ever happened to me. So I went into this like Los Angeles courtroom and with like a hundred pound backpack on. And when I came out, it was gone, and it was like, yeah, I had plenty of stuff to deal with after that. You know, a lot of the the fallout from everything, but. You know, my life changed completely. You talk about going to therapy in the book. Did you only get to that point where you were engaged in therapy after that, or no? I started, yeah, when I top of my when my career was at the highest point. And did you tell your therapist that you were a cheat? No. So yeah, even I was, in therapy, I even lied to him. I, well, that's mad, yeah, isn't it? I was it? a good liar. I was like, a good liar. When you think about that, it's I lied like to this, my parents, my therapist. Yeah. I mean, I, I can understand the parents, right? Because like that's the that's a very big leap to go, and and so there's literally only your wife at at, at the start. Yeah, she knew. She knew. And then, but even your therapist is supposed to be the safe space. It's like, yeah, right. So I'm going right. through some stuff here. I just need to tell you this thing. Right. Right. <laughs> like, right. Right. So that's kind of an indication of how crazy the whole it thing. It's crazy. I know. I couldn't even tell my therapist or you know I should have and um, but no it was just eating me up inside big time big time and as soon as I told the truth yeah life hasn't been all roses but it's been a lot it's gotten so much better so much better now I don't have to lie anymore now I don't have to 
make up lies to cover up the lie. Yeah. And then, like the more you lie, the more you have to make up lies to cover up the lies. And like, and then you have two lives going on at the same time. And it might look good from the outside, but on the inside, I was a mess. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then, yeah, the, you know, I was fortunate that I got the opportunity to tell the truth. You know, I felt like I was t ten years too late to tell the truth. Yeah. Like, way beyond that opportunity. But I did tell the truth, and you know. So many people forgave me, like straight away. You know, obviously they were disappointed, but well, I think there's, you know, a, a, and it's I, a, a good lesson in life. I know? think it's clear that there are good dopers and bad dopers. The good dopers are the ones who go chapter and verse. This is how it happened. This is who it happened with. This is why it happened. This is the details on it. The bad dopers are like, well, everybody else is doing it, so I mean, it's not that big a deal. Screw you. I'm not telling you. And like you, it seems like the ones who tell the truth, actually, whatever their motivation is, the impact is that it has a benefit for the sport. That it actually helps people learn about the how and the why and how screwed up these sports are. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I feel that's one of my big motivations is to you know tell as many people who will listen just so it doesn't happen to them. You know, I wish I had heard a story like mine before I got into this crazy sport of cycling. Um, you know, it was it was a it was rotten to its core at the time, and. Um, yeah, I made some poor decisions for sure, a lot of them. But you know, the cards were definitely stacked against me. Um, like you detail very well in the book and in other interviews, the decision to actually do open the first place because yeah. essentially it's the competitive edge. Really, is the underlying driver of all of this. It's outside influences. It's Lance, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But at what point do you realize that to become a successful cheater, you then need to become a successful liar? And what did you feel at that point when you started to realize that you have to live this double life? Um, yeah, you know, I, I remember, I think it was after the 98 tour, you know, there, there was a Festina affair, and I remember coming back at the end of that season back to the States, and, and my dad asking me about, about it, and he asked me if I'd ever dope, straight away, pff, no, you know, like, pff, didn't even have to think about it, you know, I was like, wow, I bec I've become a good liar, and that was probably the hardest lie, and then after that it became easier and easier. And all of a sudden, like, these two lives just kind of came about. And, uh, yeah. Are you constantly out of body looking at yourself, going, whoa, shut up, stop saying that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, those committee meetings I called them in the middle of the night, yeah, you'd sit there and look at the ceiling and think about just all the lying you had to do, like, you know, how much longer can I do this? You know, am I going to get caught? That, my biggest fear was, am I going to get caught? You know, I thought way more about that than I thought about winning, you know, which is pretty crazy. Well, let's talk about 2004, because that's the year that you, you do ultimately get caught. Yeah. In retrospect, it looks a bit like you wanted to get caught in some ways, because there's a warning from the UCI. It's yeah. like, uh, here, listen, come in here. You're doing really well. We're a bit suspicious of you. Yeah. Your values are a little bit high. You're not getting popped, but yeah. we're coming for you. And then afterwards, in Athens the A sample test positive, yeah. the B sample gets frozen, so on a technicality you're like, I'm keeping this medal. Yeah. And then the, the third time later on when they're like, you've got somebody else's blood in your veins there, yeah. how the hell did that happen? Yeah. And that's what you get popped for in the yeah. end. Yeah. Do you feel in retrospect that somewhere along the way you're like subconsciously going, I'm, I'm going to do this and the house of cards is coming down, or was it just a, just a screw up? Oh, I don't know. I mean, I was blood doping. I wasn't blood doping with somebody else's blood. So, so in my defense, I was like, I was fighting the right fight. It was like I had robbed those banks, but not this one. Okay. You know, that's how I felt. But how did they catch I should have. I should have. Uh, I wish I had told the truth back then. I mean, I would have saved myself years and years and years of pain. Like, I mean, after that, my life just changed. When, when, when I had that positive test, my life just went straight downhill. You know, I was down in the dumps for years and years and years and just suffered like a dog until, basically until I got subpoenaed and had to go in front of the grand jury. And then, then I was finally able to tell the truth, you know, I didn't, didn't have to live by the code of the Emerita anymore. And I, wow. So it, you didn't unintentionally... Take somebody else's blood? No, and so it wasn't on purpose, like so no, somewhere in your subconscious at all. it was a screw up. I don't know. The, you know, I worked with this doctor named Ufmiano Fuentes. Possibly there was a mix-up in the blood bags. I don't know. 
he had a, a very... He hasn't told me yet. Yeah, but okay. You can try to call him. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very strange mistake for somebody who was so meticulous about these sort of things and so secretive with their records and I guess to a certain extent has survived uh, the full extent, perhaps, of what might have been coming down the tracks in terms of punishment to him for him to make an error like that. Yeah, I don't know. We can try to call him and we can ask him. So it wasn't... See, I, I wondered if maybe you'd kind of at some point reached that stage where you're like, okay, I'm going to keep going here, but wouldn't it be great if I actually got caught somewhere? One of those oh, no, but, but it was a blessing in disguise, for sure. It was yeah. time. Like, I feel like, like had, that, I, had I not been caught, I, it would have continued. Well, I would have continued blood doping and taking EPO and lying to everybody, including my family and, and, if you don't and living a double life and all that. Sure, I was down in the dumps for years, but at least I didn't have to dope anymore and just, yeah, it was over. If you, I if mean, you, maybe it would have been better I got caught earlier. If you don't get the grand jury summons, do you feel like you would still be part of the Omerta? Maybe. Maybe. I mean, that's how strongly I felt. Like, I was so still... Even though I was out of the sport, I was still... I don't know, I was pretty twisted inside. Like, I, I you know... I'm a Bostonian. I grew up in Boston. I'm pretty tough. And, you know, keep a, you know, you have a secret. You, you got all, you're doing it for all your buddies. You, you know, just you take stitches. it to the grave. You take it to the grave. Then. Yeah. You know, I didn't want to. I didn't want to screw up anybody else's life, even though mine was already messed up. Like I didn't want to mess up anybody else's life, and I knew if I told the truth, I was going to have to tell the whole truth. And yeah. The whole truth was ugly, ugly. But finally, you know, push came to shove, and it was like I was. I had to tell the truth, and you know, it was a gift. It was a huge gift. Uh, does it feel therapeutic even now to talk about? It? Yeah, 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 is it? Yeah, yeah that's yeah, good. Yeah. I mean, I get goosebumps just thinking about it. Because you talk, talking about it. Yeah, it was huge, huge. I mean, it's changed my life. I don't know where I'd be today or even if I'd be around today well, when if you, I didn't tell the truth. When you think about the... Yeah, the, and this changed my life too, you know? Just sitting there for two and a half years with Dan Coyle writing this book. And, you know, Dan Coyle was almost like my therapist, you know? And when I first st started talking to him, you know, we did like s over 60 interviews. And it was like the information was just trickling out of me. You know, by the end of it, it was just pouring out of me, you know, both faucets on. Yeah, because you, you needed to. Right? I needed to, and it was just like, oh yeah, and another thing, and another thing, and another thing, yeah. When you look back at the cyclists who have died through suicide or overdoses oh, yeah. or, like, I, I mean... Could have been me. So easily. So easily. And that's the, that's the bit here that um, I think people shouldn't lose sight of, that, like, the decision to tell the truth... It's brilliant that it was forced on you because yeah. outside agencies sometimes need to intervene and help yeah, and say, for sure. okay, we're just going to have a little word here. And at the end of this, it's all going to be okay. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I, you know, I wish when I first got caught that they kind of came in a little softer and, hey, let's think about this here. But it was more like, okay, do it or, did you do it or not? Like, you know, the, I, f I feel like I wasn't really given just a little bit of time to take a step back, think about it. In 04, the first yeah. time they caught you? I've even told you that USADA, United States Anti-Doping, like, maybe they should give somebody a little bit more time before, before when they're first um, told that they have a positive test yeah. to think about it. Or maybe somebody comes in, maybe somebody like me to come talk to them. You know? Yeah. I wish you could be the talk to myself. News. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Hello, or just, you know, it's not the end of the world. Like, we all make mistakes, some bigger than others. You know? And I, I'm a good person. You know, I've, Two great parents who told me the difference between right and wrong. Um, you know, I knew from the beginning that what I was doing was wrong. But for whatever, I got caught up in it, and then it got bigger and bigger and bigger as the years went on. And then you felt this stronger bond, not only with your team and the staff, but just the whole peloton. And, you know, had I told the whole truth in 2004, I don't know what would have happened. Might have been good for me personally. I would probably would have been bulldozed by certain individuals, but um, yeah, I would have blown up the sport. But you might not have been ready for it either. You might I have probably been, wasn't ready for it. You might I have mean, been, I was certain, by the time I got subpoenaed, and I was ready for it. You know, yeah. Even though I didn't want it, I, did, I still wanted to. I waited to the last second. You know, first they asked if I'd come in as a. They call it a proffer, where you can come in with your lawyer by your side. But they called it voluntary. And I was like, no, nope, I'm not volunteering to do that. So it's just, I was still, you know, hard headed. And, yeah. This is 2010. Yeah, you know, whatever. The Emerita, like, I was caught up in it. You know, I was, you know, and it still exists today a bit, you know, but 
I'm glad I'm not a part of it anymore. Do you think it would have been a successful case had you actually spoken out in 2004? Or, or I don't want to call it a successful yeah, case because it yeah. hasn't been fully successful, but yeah. at least you had six more years and you talk about certain individuals. I mean, you had six yeah. more years or did the authorities had six more years to gather evidence on Lance Armstrong. Yeah. I mean, I think the time, it was the timing. You know, Floyd Landis came out. Mm. That, you know, who knows if you know, Floyd hadn't come out. He really kind of got the ball rolling. And I'm grateful to him for that, for uh, sure. For I do sure. want to talk about Floyd because yeah. with, without... If without him... You know, he, he also finally, need, you know, hit the wall and just said, I'm telling the truth and, you know, good on him. He needed you as well, though, because he's like a... Well, I think I helped him. And, he's a lone crank. Yeah. If, if that's the way the media pr publish it, it's like, well, sorry, that's the way that Armstrong and everybody else attacks him. It's like, oh, look at this guy. You can't trust him. He's temperamental. Yeah. But when it's him and you, it's like... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah. There's a corroborating second source on a lot of this information here. Yeah. And they all seem to be telling exactly the same story. That's a kind of coincidental thing that it's hard for everybody to deny. Right. Right. When you were... When it was good time. I mean, I think in 2004 it would have been, you know, there would have been some people who believed me. And I think there would have been a lot of people that didn't believe me. You were really good mates with, with Floyd. You, you, you go on... Um, you know, it's brave for him to go on a cycle with you around Girona because he's effectively replaced you in Lance's affections and now you're a rival for Lance and Lance I'm sure was looking at his, if he heard about it which no doubt he did was like what are you doing hanging out with that guy yeah. we're supposed to be enemies now so you obviously liked Floyd but you must have had some sense that in him there was the potential when he gets caught to bring the whole thing down and it didn't totally surprise me yeah yeah Floyd's a good guy he's a good guy you know he's made some poor decisions like myself um uh, but yeah, I always really enjoyed my time with him. Really funny guy. Yeah, um, but he's got a huge heart, big heart. And when he goes public, heart. are you kind of like, yeah, okay? Yeah. I, are you? I like mean, I got. I was a little bit nervous. Like, wow, it's coming down. And I, you know, sure enough, I get a call from federal investigator uh, Jeff Nowitzki. Uh, he investigated Barry Bonds back in the day, the baseball player. The whole Balco thing. Is Balco like thing. So yeah, and I, you know. If you look at Jeff, Jeff Nowitzki, you know, very tall, intimidating, intimidating character. Six, seven, and bald. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I owe him a lot. I mean, I feel lucky to have, I got that phone call, for sure. And, you know, I gave him every answer he, and then some. Gave him information on every, every question he had. It felt like when you got subpoenaed, it was kind of like this outpouring of emotion from you. You felt things you didn't expect to feel. Did Floyd feel the same way? Did he have a similar reaction? When obviously he was voluntary with Yeah, his. I don't know. If, you know, Floyd and I haven't talked in a while. Just there was a big investigation or a big trial uh, up to last week. So and due to the fact that I was a witness, I didn't really want to talk to either side. So. I mean, when Floyd, first of all, comes out with yeah. that information, yeah. is it therapeutic in a way for him, kind of like it was for you? Yeah, I'm sure it was. I'm sure it was, yeah. Yeah, I mean, his, yeah, his whole life has changed too since telling the truth, for sure, for sure. And you got to be so happy for him. Yeah, absolutely. And, and he's got a, his own interesting business going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And good for him. Yeah, yeah, good totally. Uh, that's the the three of you there at, at one stage oh, uh, cool. on screen. Um, all looking a bit a bit younger at this point. Yeah. What, yeah. what jersey are you in at that point? That's Rock and Republic. So this is early on. That's later. Okay. That's like 2008 or something. Okay, so at yeah. that point. Um, <laughs> You guys are barely speaking to each other. <laughs> yeah, we were probably just, yeah. That smile for the cameras. And, yeah, those are fake smiles. Yeah, there was a lot of that going on. Yeah. You mentioned the, the case up until recently. Um, it's hard for us as outsiders to feel anything other than Lance at the end has lost his reputation, has lost a lot of his standing in world sport, but has kept most of the money. So I'd say if you were to ask Lance, he kind of feels like he's doing all right. Um, yeah, I don't know. I haven't talked to him in a long time. Um, you know, it's too bad that case, you know, they didn't, that case didn't go to trial. I mean, on the short term, it was nice for me because I, I got to come to Ireland early and I got to go check out the western coast, which was beautiful. And I'll definitely come back. But uh, long term, I think it was, uh, you know, it would have been in the media for a month, you know. Uh, it would have been a long trial. And we would have learned a lot about the, the culture of the sport back then. Yeah. You know, not, we're not talking just about Lance or about, you know, it would have been ugly for probably all of us. But we would have learned a lot about the sport back then. And, um, and I think we would have gotten some, a lot more answers. It would have been in the media every day. It would have been, created a lot of dialogue every day. And we're not going to get that. 
and uh, you would have heard you know testimonies from each of these individu individuals. I think it would have eventually pushed other people that haven't you know come to terms with the truth to come out and tell the truth. Because there's a lot of there's choice plenty defense. of those guys. Yeah. There's plenty of people that haven't told the truth, and I'm not saying everybody needs to come out and tell the truth, but you know they we don't have all the, like we've only heard this much in the past. Yeah, and they, there's a lot more out they, there, and like. And if we don't really learn from what the mistakes we made in the past, so it's going to happen again. I feel like they do need to come out and tell their story. Well, because I, you know, what are we going to do now? Now it's everything's been settled. It's like now it's just going to be. It's kind of buried, and now we're moving forward. But yeah, you know, if not, I say let's get a big roundtable thing going. Whoever you know, leave the egos at the door. Come in and just talk about it, right? Because that's why I would classify Lance as the bad doper, because he's like, oh no, I've got a new podcast, it's called Forward, I'm forgetting that, that's all in the past. I'm done talking about that, no need for me to explain how, why, when, how much, what Ferrari gave me. Was I using a motor? Oh, you can have all your suspicions all you want, but I'm not going to tell you, because why would I tell you? Whereas actually, if we had the case, he would have been on the trial answering questions that we asked him, uh, did you use a motor? What's the difference between using a motor and taking drugs? Why is that a worse form of cheating than this other form of cheating? All that kind of stuff. And it feels like we've, it feels like sport has missed out. That the whole value of sport has missed out by that trial and by the original federal trial not going ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know what else they can do now just in terms of getting people together to come out and tell the truth or, or talk more about the truth. But I, I wish there was something we could do. Maybe... Yeah, you could organize something. <laughs> I'll be the first on your list. We we do. But really, but like just, you know, and get guys from the 80s who doped. You know, we, it didn't start in 1993 when Lance arrived. It didn't start in 1997 when I arrived. Like, it, it had been going on a long time, you know. When I arrived in 1997 to the big leagues of this sport, it was rotten, right? Where did it start? Like, we need some more answers. Like, I wish more people would come out and leave the ego and, let's, like, it's okay you cheated like just come on in yeah we're gonna give you a hug tell like let's talk about what happened like right for the future generations of the sport right in a way they could reclaim their achievements and go yeah we, we did do it and so I, I think it's really interesting for you to just remind everybody that in 1997 it was so filthy you filthy. are Fil you on the taxi ride over here I told this uh, the driver that um in 1997, 210 starters in the Tour de France. I'd be surprised if five were clean. And he was like, no way. I, I would think it would be the opposite. And he, he was an ex-cyclist, this guy. Right. So it wasn't just a few of us. It was, you know, it was the majority. The, the bit where you are at your absolute limits and your doctor comes and goes, this isn't doping, it's health. It's for your health. It's yeah. like, it's such an easy thing. It's like, yeah. if you're, if you're, it's, genius if you're a drug pusher it's like no this isn't cheating this is like yeah you frame that and then so your framework is completely skewed now yeah but even the doctors they you know i you know this guy gave me my first you know doping product a little red egg a little red testosterone pill you know he was a good person he was just he was doing his job you know it was what had been going on for a long long time and he legitimately felt he was helping you he did yeah and in in some ways you can really, he can go home that night and go, geez, that Tyler was going off the, off the rails there, but actually I've saved him now and he's going to have a great career. Like, that's what he can think, and that's, yeah. that's his job. Yeah. That's how twisted and screwed up this whole thing is. Yeah. How do you fix it? I don't know. I think it's, I, I, you know, I'm far from the inside. I don't, I don't know what's going on there today, but I think it's cleaner today after, you know, the whole show that we put on, you know, the dark days of cycling. Um, I would assume it's a lot cleaner, but it, obviously it's not perfect. There's guys still testing positive and I don't know, you know, and it's not just cycling. Like, no, let's, it's, let's be honest here. It's football, it's, it's American football, it's It's pretty basketball. much all the major sports, it's yeah. there. It's there. I've heard story, I, you know, I do get out and talk once in a while about all this stuff and after I'm done speaking, I'll, I get individuals that come up to me and quietly and whisper you know i've had anyone from bobsledders soccer players tennis players track and field athletes telling you about their own doping or people yeah. right yeah that must be a, a, an unintended consequence of writing a book like this people come up and go i'm trapped how do i get out of this yeah yeah it's been interesting it's been interesting but um yeah i think a lot of people look at this you know the story that i've told and 
I feel like they wish they could tell their whole story too. But a lot of people, yeah, trapped is a good word. I felt pretty trapped for a long time. I'm sure. That's a great word for it. Yeah, I was trapped. Um, trapped in my own lies. The Fuentes bit seems to be the darkest it gets, which is actually, so just to recap for people who are unfamiliar, um, you're, you're with Lance Armstrong for a period of time, win a couple of tours to France with him, mm -hmm. get too good, and so they stop giving you the drugs because you're a bit of a, uh, a threat to him, it seems, and then you get a job with Bjorn Rees, yeah. who is um, a champion doper himself, who's now in charge of a new team. He won the Tour de France in 1996, yeah. Blitzed the field, like with some epic performances that um, were kind of history making and he tells you that he did it with a, um, did he take transfusions in, in 96? That's what he told me. Yeah, so th like he's there kind of going, ah oh, listen Todd, we've got to get you some of this cool blood stuff and you secretly have actually already been on the blood stuff. I've done it once, yep, yeah, on Postal in the year 2000. I, although it hadn't had the desired impact at the time or you hadn't fully understood the yeah. potential of it. Yeah, I thought we were doing something way above and beyond at the time, but turns out that most teams, their sort of general, classi general classification leaders were doing it. So way more people were doing it than I thought. And when I arrived yeah, on CSC, it was like, we got to get you on this program. Hand me a phone number of this Spanish doctor who lives in Madrid. And uh, yeah, I contacted him. We developed a relationship. And that was Fuentes. Ufimiano Fuentes, yeah, Ufe, as they call them. Like, what I found remarkable about this whole thing is, well, first of all, if, if you come across a story at the time, the whole idea of blood bags is absolutely mental in itself. But, yeah. like, in your own story, the whole story of the bad blood bag, when you start to oh, urinate yeah. Yeah. black, I mean... That was awful. Like, last year was the, the 50th anniversary of Tom Simpson passing away as a result of amphetamines going up front too, I think. Like, was there any part of you that felt like your own mortality coming to the fore there or was it literally was your biggest worry not getting caught was it even more so than actually i could be in serious trouble here health wise yeah on, honestly this is how twist it was i was just pissed off that like i i received a b bad blood bag and it wasn't going to be <clears throat> effective yeah that's kind of where i was at you know? that's incredible levels of yeah i mean you could tell it, it had gone bad yeah basically in my urine was the dead red blood cells yeah so it seemed um, yeah, I mean, I got a fever, and it could have been really bad. It could have been awful, but, but I knew. You know, you could feel it the next day. It didn't work. <laughs> and, you know, I could tell that something had gone wrong. Yeah. And maybe it had gotten sabotaged, you know? Who knows? You, you read the um, memoirs of addicts, and there's that dissonance between what the rest of the world sees and what they're living, and you yeah, definitely... Right. You definitely have a lot of that in this, this period. It's uh, like yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, I was definitely... I needed to take two or three or ten steps back and look at the big picture. But I was just so in it, you know. I was so motivated to try to win the Tour de France, to beat... Like, I thought, you know, I thought 2004 was the year, you know. The year before I got fourth, but I did it with a... had a cracked collarbone. And... Uh, I thought 2004 was my year. You know, I had the right team behind me. I, everything was perfect, so I thought, you know. And uh, so, yeah, I was just, I needed to take, I needed to step away from the sport, you know. And luck, you know, fine, I got caught, and I did have to step away from the sport. Probably the best thing that ever, one of the best things that ever happened to me. At that stage, the motivation was to beat Lance. That was it. That was like... Well, just to win. Yeah. To win, you um, know. I mean, to beat Lance would have been icing on the cake. What would winning have given you, do you think? Or what was... Oh, the, you know, it would have gotten worse then, you know? It would just been, you know, I would have gotten... But if you put yourself I, back in 2004, Tyler's head, it's like, well, I, I'm going... I'm doing all this with the purpose of winning, and when I do that, somehow salvation will be mine. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, who knows what would have happened. Um, yeah, it would just brought on more pressure, more, you know... You're just part of a system. Yeah, I was, I was definitely part of the system. And that's, you know, but I was will, a willing participant. Sure. A willing participant, and... You know, once I bought into it, I was like, okay, this is how it's done. And I just rolled up my sleeves. I looked the other way. I changed as a person. I knew the whole time it was wrong, but I was like, F it. I'm doing it. Like, this is how it's done. I saw how, you know, certain individuals did it. This is how we're going to do it. I, you know, I got the backing from my team. 
Everybody was behind it. You know, everybody on the inside knew what was going on. Yeah. And supported it. Here we go. You're our leader. Let's do it. And you're, you're actually reaching peaks of greatness that you're capable of doing this. Yeah, I mean, I was, you know, not far from... I was a Tour de France contender, you know, for sure. Yeah. Like, that could have become an all-time great summer. Tour de France winner, Olympics winner. Is there not a chance that, okay, put yourself back into the dopers position then, that the UCI, the UCI is like, right, this guy is going to become the new Lance Armstrong. We are now going to uh, engage in a fairly amicable relationship, and you might have called in a few favours that Lance did during his career. At that point then, uh, the U-turn to becoming uh, somebody who speaks out about this stuff would have been, like, you'd be beyond the point of no return at that point. Yeah, who knows? Who knows? Mm -hmm. how, yeah, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know, but I, f yeah, I feel lucky that it's, that it's, it stopped, it stopped, it stopped abruptly. Yeah, it was pretty painful, obviously, at the time. I was in a, just a daze for a, a, a long time, like, is this really happening? And then, yeah, it took some, t it took some time, but, yeah, here I, <laughs> yeah. Here I am. And I never thought I'd be in this position. I never thought I'd be a professional cyclist, just. When I got the, the green light that I was going to start the tour, that I made the selection to be in the tour within my team, you know, I called my parents and I said, you know, come over, come over early, because I don't know if I'll finish. And this is probably my first and last one. I'll probably be back in school next year. I had no idea where I was going. But, yeah. It kind of felt like a kind of a wild dream. Yeah. I mean, it was, though. Like, cause, so, again, people forget this, but so Le Mans happens and cycling in America is supposed to explode. Yeah, that was cool. That and was... it explodes a little bit at kind of grassroots level, yeah. but it really crosses over into the mainstream when Knight get behind Lance. And yeah. uh, the first Tour de France that he wins, you guys are in like a, a rented, yeah. beat up... Yeah, we call ourselves the Bad News Bears. That was a pretty cool tour, like, you know, under the circumstances. It was, uh, you know, we weren't expected to win. You know, they said Lance was strong, but he had a poor team behind him, and so yeah, we were. We had most teams had the big buses. And we had two rented campers. Are you Paniagua in that race? No, no. no you're, okay, so you're EPO. EPO. Yep, yep. And we There's had, had Motoman then. Yeah. Okay. So that's the, that's the Motoman one. Yep. So only... It was Lance's gardener would drop off uh, syringes of EPO to the team staff. To my This is the year after the Festina affair. Okay. So, so nobody's going to be carrying it in their car. So after the Festina affair, things went underground. Yeah, and that's when it actually becomes the individual responsibility of the cyclists to dope. Yeah, I mean, their team was still involved, but sure. to a lesser degree. They, did, they had to keep their hands sort of clean. Plausible deniability. And, mm. uh, and also, but really, it's like they can scapegoat you at any point as opposed to them yep. taking it. It's yep. a, a brilliant yep. so corporate needed, move. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah. We just fo found a, a different way to do it, you know. And other teams did this, had their, their mo types of moto men yeah. as well. You know. I heard some riders just kept it in their suitcases. And that was as easy as that. Took the chance. Yeah. Just took the chance. And there was no more buses. So we weren't, we weren't going to do that because you know, the year before they were actually raiding hotels and raiding riders' rooms and checking their yeah. suitcases. So we were smarter than that. Yeah, yeah. And more adventurous. <laughs> yeah. It, it seems so like we had moto men. It seems like that was the perfect timing. Like, Fasina just happened the year before, whereas uh, after a couple of years of you guys at the peak of US Postal, no other team could really infiltrate the, the Peloton to the level that you had because Lance had a private jet. You could, uh, you could fly your EPO in your jet if you wanted to, or, or even your blood bags, rather, yeah. whereas other teams still had to cross borders and, and all that sort of stuff. Right. They needed to get really rich to do what you were doing very, very well, and you, ha you were so dominant and you had the transportation of the drugs off to such a T that you weren't going to allow them to penetrate your success. Yeah, we weren't going to be denied. That was sort of the mentality. For sure. Like, but, I, and, yeah, I mean, you know, you can love him or hate him, but Lance, you know, I like to win, but Lance really had to win. He, second to me was really good, and, but he didn't like to finish in second. So he was the mo most motivated person that I saw ever that wanted to win was, was Lance. People are still obsessed with him. Like, and I guess even uh, last week is maybe an end to, in some degree of, I just, I remember thinking, it had been such a long time since he'd been in the news, and then going back to do some research on the interviews, like, oh, now I remember why everybody thinks he's such a dick and why he's such an 
he appears to be evil so often. Because you, you have to remember all the stuff that he pulls, all the people that he bullies along the way, all the, all the lives that he ruins and the people that he threatens and the, the aggression, aggression that he goes at people. That'll pass over a period of time. Everybody just go, oh, that was that guy, what was his? He's, he's a celebrity, he's just a cyclist. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the pity, I think, of, of what's happened. And yeah, why it's moving on. And why it's important for you to keep telling your story, I think. Yeah, I mean, I'm not here just, you know. We, obviously, Lance and I have our stuff. You know, we're not, we're, I would, we're not friends anymore. I, I don't, certainly don't hate him. I used to hate him, hate his guts. I don't hate him anymore. I've, for, you know, forgiven him in my own sort of way. He didn't speak to you after Oprah or around Oprah, no, did he? No. But, um... But I'm not here to talk just, you know, no, I'm just here to share my story and, you know, tell the truth about, you know, what can happen if you're, um, if you don't really think about long-term consequences. I think the obsession, there's two, there's two things there, the um, winning at all costs, which I, I would like to hear you to talk about before we wrap yeah. up. But the other thing is that USADA um, had promised everybody that this wasn't just going to be, uh, we're just going to go get Lance and that's all, or a couple of cyclists. It's going to be, we're going to try and change the culture of the sport and water exactly the same. But effectively, WADA has proven to be a bit of a waste of time and money, and I'm not really sure if I hold USADA in any esteem at the end of this whole process either, in that they did just go after Lance, and they didn't really have material impact, it seems to me, on the impact uh, on the sports culture. Uh, it's tough to say. You know, th we've come a long... Don't, let's not forget that, um, you know, these organizations didn't, didn't exist, you know, 15, 20 years ago. They've come a long ways, and... You know, there wasn't even an EPO test back in 99. It didn't come about till the year 2000. I think USADA finally got, you know, they, were, they started out, I think, in the early 2000s. And um, didn't, I think Travis t Tiger told me they got, didn't get into really full steam until maybe mid, the mid-2000s. Um, so they've, they've made a, some, they've come a long ways. Let's. They obviously there's, they still have a long ways to go, but you know it's tough. There's um, the the dopers are usually and the doping doctors and, and are usually a step or two ahead, and um, you know they have a tough road ahead of them. So they got to keep working hard, and um, you know I, I support them both, Wada and Usada. Yeah. Okay. So you think they're doing? They could be better, but they're we're, doing. Yeah. They're we're, getting there. We're, yeah. We got to support them. We got to give them encouragement. You know. Um, we. We're pretty obsessed with the idea of motors in the peloton on this show. Obviously, we got Lance on the record about it and then yeah. um, talked to the guy who invented the motor that's small enough to fit in. Um, you did the documentary where the motor can clearly fit in the bikes. Oh, yeah. Do you think it's credible that there has been at the, in the past the use of motors in the biggest stage races in the world in the Tour de France? Is it something that you think could have happened? I think it could have happened. I think it could have. You know, after... I did a little uh, yeah, interview with 60 Minutes and they showed me what it's, what, it, what it's all about and how small and inconspicuous it could be. I was surprised. Were you? Like, yeah, I, was, I mean, when I was a, a cyclist, I never had heard about it. And then all of a sudden, you know, in the, I think 2008, 2009, you started hearing about it. And there were certain videos out there that looked pretty um, interesting. Yeah, and there's loads more. Now that the, the stuff on YouTube comes up, you're like... Well, hang on yeah, yeah, there's some stuff that makes you definitely scratch your head. Um, and there's been a rider or two that, that have been caught. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Were your bikes from what I've heard, from some, for, I do have a few inside sources, and from what I've heard, yeah, it's been used at the biggest races in the world Yeah, by big riders. So I think they're, te they're testing bikes to a certain extent now. We have no idea to what extent that's happening. Were any of your bikes ever tested during your cycling career? No, not that I know of, no. So if that technology was available back then, and you mentioned the fact that, like, say, say the Motorman version of whatever that would be for motorized doping, it was every cyclist for themselves, every team for themselves, that would suggest that it could well have been happening in the peloton without your knowledge. It could have, yeah. I didn't know anything about it or hear anything about it back then, but um, it could, certainly could have happened. After what I saw in that 60 Minutes program, that yeah. they showed me what it's all about. Was, I, so wow. I, I did ask and that. I tried it out. It was pretty cool. Was it? Yeah. yeah. And so yeah. here's the question. And I was not fit, and I went up a climb pretty fast. <laughs> yeah. In, if, if I come to you when you're, like, you're on the side of the road, there's a brilliant story about you being on the side of the road, and like you feel this kind of torrent, and you look down, and you're 
the wound from the uh, blood transfusion hasn't healed and you're oh like God, yeah. you know, it's like if I'd come to you in that street corner and said here listen you don't need to do that anymore I've got this little thing you just slip it in your back wheel no one's ever going to know would you have motor doped? I don't think so really that, that's so, the but line I mean, yeah, but like, who knows back then like I mean I was pretty you know I was so in it who, who knows but I, I don't think so I don't think so yeah. why not? I, that just seems like a whole nother, another level you know, taking your own blood out. Well, but that's <laughs> you know that's I mean? so much better. Not that I was yeah. some angel or anything. No, no, no I know, but that's like sure, so. This is know, no, these but, are the but philosophical. Know, so you know, if you have enough people telling me that it's like the right thing to do, the right thing those guys do, over there, they have it, and they're all doing it too. Like who knows? Yeah, who knows? yeah. But I would like, like to think I would say no, absolutely not. Yeah, and I'm pretty sure I would have. Okay, but you know who knows yeah the context is, is harder well you yeah. now obviously yeah, would but. it just seems like another let's like, like dope in times two almost yeah because there is a code there's a, a weird code that runs through the book there's like periods of the book where you're pissed off we, we were talking about this earlier you're, you're pissed off at Lance for talking smack about you in the peloton oh yeah there's a possibility that he's ratted you out to whoever he did like I mean you're less pissed off with him about ratting you out than you are about him talking smack there's like a hierarchy here of like, I can't believe he's talking about me bad in the Peloton. But he's just told the UCI that he yeah. thinks you're doping. Go get that guy. Yeah. Like so, that, that code, is a, it's still part of that cyclist's who you are. That's the cyclist identity. That some things are okay and some things are... Right. Yeah, we're all twi a little bit twisted. Yeah, it's, it's for true. sure, for yeah. sure. But I don't know. I mean, I've heard so many different stories about... Out, well outside of sport I've heard stories about people in Wall Street and how just you know they get so into something and they're you know before they know it they're so deep in it you know way past the gray zone into the black zone and yeah it, it can happen you know, just little by little it's the snowball effect before you know it you know that little red egg that little red testosterone pill I took in the spring of what 1997 you know it was a little speck of dirt on my shoe you know little did I know you know years later I'd be like up to my neck yeah. in mud yeah I had no idea where, where that was leading you know had I known that back in 97 where it was going I think I would have been on that first flight back to Boston you know that is the win at all costs mentality yeah. that's why that's what the culture it's a big debate in Irish sport at the minute there's like a a real fear that we're losing sight of some uh, core values and yeah. that um, we've just decided that ultimately nothing matters apart from victory Yeah, and it's led to some pretty ugly situations and I think that um, certainly anybody who reads the book thinks eh, it's okay to finish second or just to do your best what's wrong with finishing 50 second you know as long as you gave your best right you know I was watching the Olympics this what was it recently and it's not about the U.S. It's like not about how many medals we win. It's about all about how many gold medals we win. It's just I don't know. It's kind of disgusting. And then you know I don't know if you saw the movie Icarus. Yeah, but it's getting bad. And like how many Icaruses were there out there that we don't know about? You know, I mean, there's plenty of story. Like it's just the tip of the iceberg. I think. What did you make of Icarus? You know, and, you know this is just the tip of the iceberg. Yeah. You know, there's plenty more. There's a thousand different secret races out there. What did you make of watching, when you were watching Icarus, were you, like, yeah, I, I mean, great film, great, I mean, incredible, incredible story, jaw-dropping, really. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I was a little bit naive, I guess. I didn't think it would go to that level. It, but it, it did. Yeah. It did. It's like, because it, you know, to what degree do you, will you go to, to win? It, it turns exactly. out it makes I don't know, it makes you not really want to compete. Like I don't know, I'm kind of disgusted by competition a little bit. Not disgusted. That's not no. That, but, that, word, so, but you know, I don't know. I'm not competing ever again in my life. Right. I like to enjoy sport, be a tourist. Yeah. But I don't know. Yeah, I was riding back on, from my cycling trip on the west coast the other day, that other day, and I was going through this town. And they were playing a a, a what a Gaelic football, Gaelic football game. Yeah. Yeah. Galway versus uh, Mayo. Oh yeah, Galway Mayo. Yeah, and man, you could feel the hatred between the two teams. You know? Were you at us? No, I didn't. Uh, I, but I was riding my bike, like right, right. I rode right, right by the stadium, and yeah, you could feel just the energy. Like it was uh, pretty wild. But yeah, and I was kind of just thinking about 
the sport in general. And well, so it's Gaelic football, really, that um, people are concerned that the win-at-all-cost mentality is seeping into the whole sport of GA, and oh, really? you're hiving off kids at the age of 12 and saying, okay, you're an elite Gaelic footballer, you're going to be part of this elite training squad, and we'll take you away from your clubs, and then you stay that the whole way up to the time that you're 22, and then you fall out of love with the game because you've been flogged and actually don't really have an exterior life, and that people are concerned that that's not necessarily the right way to do things. Yeah. Um, we're prioritizing uh, the elite over the fact that the clubs that those 12-year-olds come from is an amateur club where parents go with their children to meet other parents who are like-minded and to get their kids out and have a bit of a runaround. Yeah. And yeah, we, you know, we're a sports program and we love elite sports and love watching it, but yeah. at the same time, very concerned about the fact that maybe we don't really worry too much about the people who... Um, are being offered the red pill and going, well, why wouldn't I take it? Right, right. Yeah, in the, back in the States, the pressure to, uh, for kids these days is you know, greater than ever. Kids these days have to pick a sport, you know. They can no longer do three sports when they're 12, 13 years old. They've got to pick their sport, you know, when they're super young. And if not, they're, um, they're not getting in with the right squad and they're not getting the all the right opportunities so yeah. they've got to pick and you know that's that's terrible they should be able to do five different sports totally. whatever they want just have fun with it it doesn't matter do you think you'd dope again if you were that person that like the circumstances haven't changed enough for you the you point you made earlier if I'd known what I know now I, you know I got back on the plane to Boston but there's no way to teach all the 18 year olds the, when it's for your health yeah, would I dope again had I known what I know? No, no, I, like you, obviously you couldn't know what you know, but do you think enough has changed in the world that the today Tyler no, Helton... I don't think so. I don't think enough's changed, yeah. And that bothers me, you know, I, I mean, I do, yeah. I do, you know, I've, I've come a long ways and have peeled a lot of the layers of onion, onion off and um, feel like a lot better person today, but what still bugs me is, yeah, have have we done enough to to move forward and to say okay like yeah we can close the door on the past and move forward now and 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 do that with our head held high you know I don't think we have no I think we need to dig a little bit more and like you know like I said before drop our egos come out be honest and like let's do it for the future generations not of just cycling but of all sport right we got to figure out a way it's 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 getting, the pressures are getting higher and higher. You feel comfortable having that role as as an activist, effectively? That like, there's a lot of talk about athlete activism at the moment, particularly in the states, and like, you know, I don't know how I'd go about it, but yeah, I'd be happy to. I'd be happy to. Um, you know, I'm sort of persona non grata in the sport of cycling. Well, that's good. That's a good starting point. <laughs> Is it? That's the perfect starting point. Only people who are PNG can uh, actually kind of have some PNG persona non grata. Oh, I like that. Well, like kind of have uh, some credibility when it comes yeah, to this. Right. Will you help me? Totally, yeah. Okay. Whatever we can do. Owen, you in? Oh, 100%. All right, we got three. Nice one. Three we got three. Floyd on board as well. <laughs> All right, Floyd's in. Just from listening to you for, for the last, whatever, 40 minutes or however long uh, this has been going on for, you clearly still love cycling. I mean, it's, it's the, the very negative things that you dislike. We pointed that out. And talking about the secret race, talking about Icarus, the key components of those and the two things that link it are the people that spoke. There is no guarantee that whatever's happened in the... Uh, that whatever we've seen in cycling and other sports is clean over the past decade. There is also no guarantee that we're going to see another Gregory Rachenkov, another Floyd Landis, another Tyler Hamilton who will actually speak out about this because it does seem as many leap forwards as the authorities have made. Without a whistleblower in these situations, we will never know the full truth. Um... Yeah, it helps to certainly have a whistleblower for sure. Um, yeah, I don't know if we've come. I don't know if we've come that far. It, it, it still bothers me. Like, I, I, you know, I do have a lot of respect for Wada and Usada, but I think we still have a lot of room to go. You know, um, we can dig deeper. You know, let's figure out how it all went wrong. Really? Yeah. Right. Go to the start. See what the methods were. Let's just talk. Let's. Yeah, I mean, I know people want to just. Look, look ahead and keep going forward, but like that's pointless. Like, it's, yeah, we got to look back and figure out where things went wrong, how it went wrong. And, we could start know. a podcast called Backwards. That'd be <laughs> <laughs> people, people might get the joke. 
Tyler, you've been really good with your time. Thanks so much uh, for joining us. Thank and, you for uh, having me on your show. We'll, uh, we'll do that cycle in the west of Ireland sometime soon. Okay. That's a deal. Really? I'm putting yeah. you down on it. Yeah, now that's a deal. All right, five, six days. Yeah, cool. We can do that. Each of you. Yeah. Right, we'll raise some money for deal. a good cause. Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Yeah, so that new uh, podcast backwards, I'm looking forward to that. Yeah, I've already uh, written the script for the first episode. Because it's going to be scripted, so I don't know why anybody <laughs> would write a script for a podcast. But we need to um, we need to trademark the name, you know. Yeah, definitely. I mean, what, what, whatever he does, uh, Tyler can do the opposite. Just every single thing he says, just you know, like he can do his own Tour de France podcast and maybe talk about things that aren't involved in the actual racing of it, uh, like the you know the stages podcast during the summer. I don't know. We need to work on a few ideas because let's not have the production meeting on air. No, <laughs> that's prob- rule number one. If only we'd had a couple of days to think this through. Uh, okay, so um, whenever we do these stories about cycling, whenever we have anybody on who has a, a past like um, Tyler Hamilton has. The response is two camps. One is uh, thanks for covering this, and the other is like, I can't believe you're not covering all the other good stuff. Why don't you ever cover the good stuff? It's like there isn't um, there isn't a limit on the amount of time that we can spend talking about stuff. Time is a flat circle, and we can continue to do these stories while we also perhaps start talking about other stories. Um, you were talking about the first time you read Rough Ride, and how it actually inspired you to want to watch cycling again. Having been reading that book last week in, a, in preparation for, or rereading it in preparation for um, Tyler coming in, I actually want to watch the Tour de France this year and started to get sucked in a little bit to what's happening in the Giro. Just a little bit. I mean, Chris Froome was there and that's ridiculous, so it's hard to watch um, Chris Froome being there. And I would argue that covering these stories properly and having somebody on like Tyler talking about. Uh, doping in the way that he's talked about it and getting everybody in a room and having a truth and reconciliation but a, a proper one will help the sport to recover as opposed to hindering the sport but l- let's just bring in the comments anyway so um, why can't you cover cycling the story is old says Alzbeta uh, everybody know it and since then cycling has moved forward there are so many nice and interesting stories not just doping hashtag OTBAM uh, at EM underscore creative Sam Bennett's doing rather well at the Giro isn't he Watched the Ross go by the other day. A brilliant race, isn't it? But no, let's talk about a 10-year-old dough case, dot, 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 hashtag OTBAM. The point is that Sam Bennett is not currently available to come into the studio for us, M underscore creative, whereas uh, Tyler Hamilton is literally one of the most interesting people in the history of world dope stories. Like, his chapter and verse completely helped to verify the chapter and verse that came out from Floyd, and so suddenly you have two absolute pillars of the US Postal Team from different periods of Lance Armstrong's era, detailing precisely how organized and brilliant the doping was. Uh, Killian Kelly, come on Killian, how are you? At Irish Peloton. Sam Bennett giving Ireland his most successful Grand Tour in 30 years. Ryan Mullen is riding a Grand Tour for the first time. The Ross is currently on, so off the ball of Tyler Hamilton on talking about Lance Armstrong and doping. Again, there's no... Um, there's it's not no pointed, th- I mean... <laughs> That kind of would suggest that maybe people think it is pointed or something. Tyler Hamilton happened to be in Ireland uh, last week. We did an interview with him while he was here. We took the opportunity of somebody who has a really good story to tell, uh, which isn't just a cycling story either, obviously. Um, we talked to him about a lot of stuff there, um, particularly the win-at-all-cost mentality, which I think is going to resonate for a lot of people. It's, it's interesting to actually make yourself honestly believe that this is like some sort of dig at Sam Bennett or something, or some sort of dig at the success of the Ross. It's interesting how that leap can be made. At Alpha One Girl on the other side says, a really good interview, fair play to Tyler to his openness. Uh, Mick Ruby read his book a few times, great story, very honest. It is the type of book that you can read and reread because it's like, it's, the detail is so intense about how and when and why and which bit they were doping and which race they were going through. The, um, the detail merges a little bit. There's definitely two grand tours that he completes having had serious injuries in, right? Am I mixing this up? Two, uh, pretty sure they're two Grand Tours. There's certainly two different... Separate incidents. Yeah. Years um, apart, a year apart, I think. Is there? Like, you've got the shoulder incident, which is the famous one. I'm trying to recall. I've only read it once. I, I, it was a while ago. Uh, Angus Cody says, Incredible book. Of all the books, Seven Deadly Sins, etc., Tyler's is the most fascinating. Um, at John G. Horrocks. Great name. Says, uh, I read The Secret Race in December 2012. Tyler, you kept me awake for 36 hours. I couldn't put it down. Paul Leonard says, his book is an excellent read. Lads taking blood from their dogs to use for blood transfusions during the latter stages of the tour. Crazy. I don't remember that detail in the book. That is incredible. Yeah, I don't remember it either. 
And Isla Cody says, going to reread The Secret Race after the first snippet of the interview with Tyler Hamilton. Utterly brilliant. And can't wait to hear the full thing. Great interview. Thanks for that, uh, Isla. Hope you're well. Like, that's the one thing that has to be said. It, it is a brilliantly written book. Daniel Coyle does a brilliant job in actually putting pen to paper on the book and evoking the best memories from Tyler Hamilton. And the same, like you mentioned, Rough Ride there. Like, I, I really just don't understand what the, the basis is in the fact that, you know, oh, Paul Kimmage's book ruined cycling, which is complete nonsense. The first thing I did after I read Rough Ride, I think the first time I read it was like January or February time, must be in February time, because I, the first thing I did was put Parry Nice on serious link on Eurosport, and that may seem like the saddest thing anybody's ever done in sport, but I actually sat down and I watched, uh, not the full stages in fairness, the highlights, the one-hour highlights on Eurosport every single evening of Parry Nice, because I was so... I was so intrigued in the sport that Paul Kimmage had kind of blown wide open and all the things that happened behind the curtain almost added to that intrigue, almost added to this element of being a spectator and to, to the idea of being a spectator sport. So it's actually had the opposite effect for me. Maybe other people feel differently when they read the sort of stuff that they can't stomach it, but you know, it's, it certainly increased my fascination with the sport. The, the, this level of writing to do with uh, cycling, it's almost up there with boxing in terms of the great literature that's been done in the sport. Yeah. Certainly the stories that are coming out now and um, the soap opera surrounding the sport is huge. And like, that's, all, that's actually just part of it. I mean, in fairness to the people who are cyclists and who love the sport, sometimes they're right when they say, what about football? And why does football not get held to the same standards? Um, Fuentes, who was the doctor that uh, Tyler Hamilton was using to dope after he left US Postal when he was with um, Fonak and um, Bjorn Reese, um, he was clearly doping football teams, important football teams. And unfortunately, those blood bags got destroyed and we'll never know exactly the names and dates and times of the people involved. But um, he was the world's best, certainly the Spanish best one in Spain, doping. And um, it's clear that there were football teams involved with him. Um, Spain was the best country in the world to dope in because they didn't have any uh, legislation that would have prevented you from, from doping, whereas the French at least could use their customs officials and all that kind of stuff because they had anti-doping legislature on the books. Uh, so, look, I don't believe in football as a dope-free sport. I don't believe in rugby as a dope-free sport. Um, but I guess that's the way it works.